Hey, okay. So first of all, happy Halloween. <laughs> now, if you remember last year, we talked about uh, Vincent Price. Tonight, we're going to talk about Elsa Lanchester. Now, as I was searching for information on Elsa Lanchester, I happened to come across a picture of Elsa and Vincent together. So here it is. <laughs> oh, I was so happy to find that. Um, but as it turns out, <laughs> when talking about Elsa Lanchester, so many people say that their introduction to Elsa is Bride of Frankenstein or Mary Poppins. And there are a select few who say that it's the uh, I Love Lucy episode, which I didn't know that she was in an I Love Lucy. <laughs> I haven't seen all the episodes, but <laughs> but me, my introduction was the 1965 version of um, That Darn Cat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like the Disney Channel showed that movie constantly and the reason for that is because when I was a kid the Disney Channel would have like Haley Mills weekend or Dean Jones weekend or Edwin weekend well those three people are in that movie they would also have like Roddy McDowell and uh again those four people alone were in that movie. <laughs> and of course, Elsa Lanchester, she played the nosy neighbor. <laughs> and and uh, one of my favorite Disney movies. And um, yeah, uh, those of you that are familiar with the 1994 version, it is a remake. <laughs> And my friend Alberto was shocked when he when I told him. <laughs> I would like to think that he has seen the uh, the original at this point, but um. <laughs> but anyway, so let's talk about Elsa Lanchester. I'm going to tell you something right now. I had so much fun learning about Elsa because <laughs> oh my gosh this lady i mean if you thought that she was amazing simply for being in bride of frankenstein oh my <laughs> oh my goodness oh she well let's just let's just jump into this so she was born in lewisham london on October 28, 1902. Now, her parents, James Sullivan and Edith uh, Biddy Lanchester, were uh, Bohemians. And they refused to marry in a, relig a religious or legal way. And... <laughs> Here's this. This is this is like the one big rabbit hole that I I came across. So I'm I'm not gonna get too into it. I will put information in the description box about Edith. Um, this was like th this was in the newspapers, uh, for quite some time, from what I was reading anyway. Um. But basically, she refused to marry James. She basically, her, her reasoning being that getting married would take away her independence. Now, these days, it, do, it doesn't seem like a big deal because that happens all the time. Her just moving in with him and living with him what's the problem <laughs> you know <laughs> and um yeah well in 
the late Victorian, early Edwardian era, that was taboo. Okay. And here's the problem. The, the unfortunate situation is that the air quote medical field, if a woman had her own opinion on something, such as Edith did, she was committed and considered mentally ill. And that's what happened. Her father was appalled by the fact that she refused to actually get married because she had, uh, it, and, and so he and her brothers, Edith's brothers, called the doctor, and when she voiced her reasoning, he said, she needs to be committed. <laughs> now... I got mad. <laughs> but again, you you got to put yourself in that situation where it's the time. It's still frustrating and everything. Yeah. I understand that a lot of people are going to get upset and and all of this and rightfully so. I was upset, but again, that's how it was back then. And, um, but you know what, another thing to take into account is that there were men that were committed for having an opinion that went against society's way of thinking. So it wasn't just women. <laughs> I want to make that very clear before people start flooding the comments about how, oh, it was a gender thing. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, it was not. So, yes, um, now Elsa uh, talks about this in her autobiography, I think it's an autobiography, but she also talked about it in interviews about how her parents were very, very political. So, <laughs> <laughs> and um, again, you have to consider that during World War One everything yeah and so she so she talks about that in interviews and everything i watched a couple of interviews where she brought up her mom and so and and it seemed to bother her just how incredibly political her parents were now as for her parents just living together it didn't seem to bother her so much and um so, but again, I, I will put all that information. There are people here on YouTube that have covered um, what is known as the Lancaster kidnapping case. That's what it was called in the newspapers. And um, they do a better job of explaining it than I do, so <laughs> than I ever could. So I highly recommend you check that out. Um but anyway, that's what happened to her mom. Um, it was, and I want to make it very clear, it was her dad. It was Edith's father and brothers who committed her simply because she just decided to move in. And <laughs> and I, I did get a little upset, and then I had to remind myself, okay, it was the time period and, and everything. But again, it's not a gender thing because there were men who were committed simply for having an opinion that went against, yeah, went against society's way of thinking. So make that clear. Um, now, she had an older brother. Elsa had an older brother. Uh, his name was Waldo. And he was a puppeteer with marionettes. And I'll put his information in the description box. His marionettes are so gorgeous. I mean, <laughs> this is another little rabbit hole I fell into. Now, he did write a book about reviving uh, puppeteering and, and that sort of thing. And um, he actually worked with George Bernard Shaw, who was actually a fan of puppeteering and and uh, marionettes and, and everything. So that's exciting because I knew the name George Bernard Shaw. 
and um, so he had um, Waldo had his own uh, marionette company. Again, I will have a lot of all that information in the description box. I highly recommend you check it out. And um, if you have any information, those of you in the UK have any information concerning that you would like to uh, tell us in the in the comments, please, by all means. <laughs> <laughs> now, Elsa studied dance uh, under the uh, under Isadora Duncan. Um, Isadora Duncan, of course, being a famous dancer during um, during this time, and uh, and that was in Paris. I I, I was getting differing uh, <laughs> ideas of how Elsa felt concerning her training under. Isadora Duncan, like Louise Brooks trained under um, uh, Ruth St. Denise, who was the founder of modern dance. And she had nothing but good things to say about uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth St. Denise and her husband. Um, but when it came, when it comes to Elsa, it was, Some people said that she absolutely loved the training that she received and she loved Isadora Duncan. Other places say that she absolutely despised Isadora Duncan and everything. There are interviews where she talks about Isadora Duncan and I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to take it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, I'm not reading it. You know, usually I can read exactly how someone either you like or dislike, I guess I'm just not reading it right, you know? Um, so yeah, cause she, she talked with, uh, there was a 1970 interview with Dick Cavett and she talks about Isadora Duncan. And um, so, but I guess I'm just not, I, I figured from her personally, I would get how she feels. And I just wasn't able to, <laughs> <laughs> to read it. I don't read people well. I, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. So it's just, now the school was discontinued because of World War One, And uh, again, it was in Paris. Uh, Elsa returned to the UK. Now she's 12 years old, 11, 12 years old. And to bring in some extra income, uh, she taught dance with the training that she received from Isadora Duncan. And uh, she gave classes to children in uh, in the South London district. And so <laughs> whatever little bit helps. <laughs> Now, after World War One, she uh, she started the children's theater. I couldn't find if it was still open. If if this particular children's theater, like if it all it all it said everywhere said it was just called the children's theater. Well, that could be anywhere. I mean, <laughs> that could be down the road from where I'm. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, I was having a hard time finding. I tried to uh, type in her name alongside it, and I, I just wasn't getting anything. And um, and then she opened up a nightclub, which had modern plays and cabaret. <laughs> And this <laughs> is the side of Elsa that I absolutely love. <laughs> yeah. Cabaret. <laughs> and uh, 
Now, the other thing she did was she uh, revived old Victorian songs and ballads. Now, by this time, it's it's uh, we're heading into the 20s. OK. And you have these vaudevillian songs, <laughs> these old uh, vaudeville tunes. And because that's what a lot of them were, they were vaudeville tunes. But um, some of them were not. Some of them were, you know, just silly little tunes and and everything. Some of them were not. Some of them were a little risque. <laughs> some of them seemed innocent enough, but they did have hidden meaning. You know, it's funny to me that the Victorians wanted to seem as innocent as possible. I talked about it in another video where. Uh, they scratched out stuff from Pompeii because, you know, it had dirty images and everything. And, and of course, they uh, chiseled out, you know, they had the David, the statue of David, and, and they put a leaf over, you know, his <laughs> phallus and everything. And, yeah, but they weren't that innocent. <laughs> <laughs> You've been caught, Victorians. <laughs> so, and so a lot of these oh, were performed in a performance uh, entitled Riverside Nights. And, uh, So, now I did read somewhere. Do I have that tab up? I'm going through tabs here because I couldn't find my notes for this. I misplaced my notes. They're somewhere in here. I just know it. <laughs> I looked everywhere. I was prepared. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, let's see. Uh, yeah, it talks about how she had a, uh, yeah, right here, during a 1926 comic performance in the Midnight Follies, a, a member of the British royal family walked out as she's saying, please sell no more drink to my father, which that is a song that I will put in the description box. <laughs> I mean, the she had, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, she was able to because of her um performances and because of uh how she was on stage during these cabaret performances it landed her in film now it was british film okay understand that and her first film performance came in 1924 it was an amateur production of the scarlet woman And um, now, for some reason, on Internet Movie Database, it doesn't show up, which that tends to happen quite a bit. Um, again, I've said it before, Internet Movie Database is like the Wikipedia of, <laughs> of the film industry. Because the first one that it shows is 1925, uh, The Scarlet Woman and Ecclesiastical Melodrama. Uh, so, and that's in 1925. Five. I think I already said that. Um, <laughs> yeah, some some places want to say that her debut was in 1927, with which would be the next uh, film that it shows is uh, one of the best, and it it just isn't. It was in 1924. And it could have been earlier than that, for all we know. I mean. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. Because of her uh, performances and because of her singing, uh, Columbia, the, the music side, not the, the film side, contacted her and wanted her to record uh in the in the studio and make a 78 rpm disc 
of four of the numbers that she's saying in reviews and which one was please sell no more drink to my father and he didn't otter which is o-u-g-h-t-e-r and uh those were recorded in 1926 don't tell my mother i'm living in sin i love these i absolutely love these and the ladies bar those those two were recorded in 1930 <laughs> these songs are hilarious now they're the lp records that i found one of them is titled songs to listen to in a smoke filled room <laughs> <laughs> and I I can't remember the other one. Um, I wish I still had the tab up. I'm not gonna go looking for it right now. Um, actually, is it down here? Oh, uh, let's see. No, it doesn't look like it's here. But um. <laughs> I mean, I the the fact that a member of the royal family, and it doesn't say who the member of the royal family is, and whether it happened or not, I don't care. Just the idea that it may have happened cracks me up because they heard this song and they're like, uh, no. <laughs> And I would love to know what she was doing as she was singing it. Now, I have seen several different um, pictures of her where she's like swishing her skirt and she's like looking at. <laughs> and uh, had a hair in my mouth and everything. And there's one where she has a ladder as a prop and at one point i'll put it here and she <laughs> so she must have been a riot on stage when she's doing these cabaret numbers and so just hilarious absolutely hilarious and um now <laughs> I mean, so, oh my gosh. And and she, just from reading this stuff, it sounds like, because one of the things when, when I used to dance, one of the things that when you were a soloist is that you had to be able to take up the whole stage, which is not, I mean, if you just use a little bit of the stage, really <laughs> so just from her pictures it looks like she gave everything with her performances i mean she just gave it her all and um makes me wish i could have seen it firsthand <laughs> <laughs> I really do. And um and and I mean the songs were just the icing on the cake. You know, watching her when I was a kid and then to to read this part and, and we're, we're just in her like 20s. This is her 20s. <laughs> so now when when she started working in film this is when she met her future husband, Charles Layton. And um, she actually worked. Now, this was a surprise to me. I didn't know that H.G. Wells made movies. He, he was just the writer of these films. I, I didn't know that. I knew that Howard Hughes made movies because I've actually critiqued a couple of them. But as for H.G. Wells... I I had no clue. And um so she showed up in I think 3 is what it 
blue bottles was the one that was considered the most um popular and she just has like a bit part in it i mean like she shows up and then leaves and um yeah three silent uh shorts written by hg wells and directed by ivor montague i'm sorry if i say the name incorrectly uh blue bottles daydreams and the tonic uh charles layton and i'm i'm sure i'm saying his last name incorrectly it does anyway uh he made brief appearances in all of those films uh and then they would show up in film and stage i mean this is pretty much where they met and then they would be in film and uh movies uh to, i mean film and stage together <laughs> but she is still in britain now was he i can't remember yeah, he was an English actor. I couldn't remember. <laughs> and um, so this is when her uh, actress career really takes off. Now, one thing that I, because I don't want to get ahead of myself here, turns out that she was in a production of Peter Pan. Now, when I uh, was trying to find like production stills to, I found stills of Charles as Hook because he played Hook in that production, but there weren't any pictures of her as Peter Pan. Now I did find uh, a, a page that gives information on that apparently there was something having to do with the change of actresses playing peter pan um the actress in one place because uh, of where they were apparently it was on tour and the actress in one place and then lanchester took over but the uh program still said the other actress instead of that would be annoying <laughs> You come to see the one actress and then it's someone else entirely. Yeah. But um, it explains everything and I, I will have it in the description box for you. So um, I was just a little devastated that <laughs> there wasn't a picture of Elsa as, as Peter Pan. That would have been so cool to see, but um, can't have everything. <laughs> but I did want to mention that. Because I thought that was really cool. She's part of, uh, part of the whole Peter Pan history, and I never knew that. And um, of course, there's a lot that I obviously didn't know about her. So, <laughs> oh, good heavens! So, um, so. Charles and getting back because <laughs> I went backwards. Now we're getting back over. Okay. So Charles and Elsa, um, uh, appear together in a film review entitled Comets, uh, which featured British stage musical and variety acts. And they sang a duet called the ballad of Frankie and Johnny. Um, I couldn't find that, but I'll keep looking um, on YouTube. And if I find it, I will put it in the description box. Um, there were songs on her album that had Charles in it. So they were um, pretty much, I wouldn't say soulmates, but it was like they were very much involved with each other's career. Um, is what I mean. And um, so uh, she appeared in uh, British talkies, uh, like uh, Pontifer's Wife, 
which starred Laurence Olivier. I've seen that movie. It's really good. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, our, our church used to show that quite a bit. And um, so I've seen, yeah, there, there's a lot of those that our church used to show. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> But that one, I mean, I think it, because it's so different, because of it being the, the perspective of what it, the point of view, I should say, not perspective, because of the point of view, that's what makes it um, interesting. And, um, and she also appears in, uh, she's uh, Anna Cleves in The Private Life of Henry VIII, which <laughs> I just want to say, I find it funny that I, I posted, I don't remember what social media, I think it was Tumblr. I <laughs> I usually post like random nonsense on my Tumblr anymore. And I said that, uh, that Henry VIII, um, he basically catfished Anna Cleves <laughs> because she basically rejected him, you know, because of the whole thing with the, the portrait and everything. Uh, basically, he she wasn't what he expected. And so he threw a temper tantrum about it. I mean, it's like the, the Tudor version of 90 Day Fiance, you know, which I don't watch. I don't. No. <laughs> My dating life is terrible. Why would I watch other people? <laughs> <It's>, uh. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I just I just find it interesting that now I'm seeing other people talk about it on <laughs> I, I found somewhere else where somebody was saying that that he was he catfished or something they use the same thing that i said <laughs> oh man so now they're still in britain because this i think this one is a british yeah it's still a british one and uh he was the thing is it late let me see something Leighton, because it seems like around this time, in the early 30s, this was the point where he was in Hunchback in Notre Dame. So, yeah, that's that's the guy. <laughs> Which would be the one with Maureen O'Hara. Okay, so if we go down. Oh, I forgot he was in Spartacus. I gotta see that movie again. Okay, let's see. So he's in that, he's in that, he's in that. Yep, we talked about that one. Oh, that's not until 1939. Okay. And he's in Mutiny on the Bounty, which is 1935. That's right. He was in Sign of the Cross. I critiqued Sign of the Cross, and he played Emperor Nero in that one. And that is an American film. That's in 1932. That is a year before. So was he working on that the same time as he must have been? So, so yeah, he was working on American films the same time that he was working on British films. I had forgotten that he played. Uh... <laughs> Too much information in my brain. So, 
because he was working in Hollywood, Elsa decided to come and join him. And this is where she got bit parts in uh, movies like David Copperfield. And that was in 1935. Um, and she was still making British films. And, or no, no, she wasn't. Uh, she, so she moved to, <laughs> sorry about that. No, <laughs> once she moved to Hollywood, um, she stayed in Hollywood. Okay, but her appearances in uh, Britain, I mean, in, in British, <laughs> I'm all in my head. Okay, so, oh, <laughs> I want to get the words out so bad. So she moved to Hollywood with her husband. Okay, they're, they're husband and wife now. When, when did they get married? Because I, I glossed over that part. They got married in 1929. Okay. So, so they haven't been married very long. She moves to Hollywood with him. Okay. So he's he's already been working in Hollywood. Now, her work in British film and uh, stage helps her get this title role Bride of Frankenstein. Oh boy. <laughs> and that was in 1935. Finally got finally got it out. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what I wanted to say, but my dyslexia was not going to let me say it. Well, I, I showed it, didn't I? <laughs> and this is the role that everybody remembers her for. And she, what what's interesting is while I was uh, researching on this, is she is with with all the other women in horror she is considered the top woman in horror and just for this one role <laughs> she only played the role once <laughs> and and like she said i've done so many things why do parents keep wanting to tell their kids about Bride of Frankenstein? <laughs> and I mean, yeah, I, I like Bride of Frankenstein. I I enjoy it, but it would get tiresome. I mean, especially with at this point, she's in her 30s. And look at all the other stuff she's done. <laughs> that would get annoying. That would get annoying fast. <laughs> Now, she, of course, appeared in other movies. Um, after she returned to Britain with her husband, and um, such as Rembrandt and Vessel of Wrath, which is a U.S. film. No, in the U.S. it's called Beachcomber. Um, they returned to Hollywood so that he would do Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1939, um, but she didn't appear in another film until 1941 when she did Ladies in Retirement. Um, <laughs> they play, uh, she and Charles played husband and wife, and their characters were named Charles and Elsa Smith in Tales of Manhattan in 1932. Now, I looked to see if this was, um, like, if, if Mr. and Mrs. Smith was, like, a remake of this in any way, shape, or form. It's not. It's just a coincidence. And I just find it funny that they named the characters Charles and Elsa because in Silent Era... You see a lot, like with Buster, um, 
a, a lot of times with his silent movies, the character name is Buster, or like with Roscoe, his character name is Roscoe. And same thing with uh, it. <laughs> it's like it doesn't really matter with these short films, especially. They don't really need to slap on an actual name for the character because. <laughs> So they just use their own. So I just found it funny that when they're playing a husband and wife, they just use their own names. <laughs> Why not? Now, in 1944, she was in a movie titled Passport of Destiny. She received top billing, and that's the only time in her Hollywood career that she ever received top billing. And that had to be devastating for her. You think about it. She started in the 20s and her filmography goes to the 70s. Uh, her last one is in the in 1980. So for all those years and you only get top billing once. That now <laughs> her the uh, her co-star in Bright of Exit, which Boris Karloff. There, there was a feud between him and uh, Bella Lugosi, and that had to do with the fact. I mean. You know, I, I still say that there was a whole thing because of the fact that he was Hungarian. And so they they basically went after him for that. And it was just like. But. Uh, and. <laughs> but it didn't work out so well because he finally got top billing. It, it seems like there were. Yeah. That was so frustrating. I remember researching for that video, which I probably will redo. And Bella Lugosi was kicked around a lot. And, uh, yeah, Boris, Boris Karloff. And what's funny about that is that I remember reading that uh, Bella Lugosi played Frankenstein at one point. So for all the tantrums that... Karloff for for having top but he had to have top billing and then his <laughs> yeah oh man whatever <laughs> but she continued to do movies in the 40s she uh, one of my favorites is the bishop's wife every christmas i have to watch the bishop's wife she plays the housekeeper and uh, she has some of the best lines in that movie. <laughs> and uh, my my family always makes fun of me because uh, my classic Hollywood crush is Cary Grant. And so when you watch how Elsa Lanchester acts around uh, Cary Grant in that movie, they always say, that's how you would act if you were around Cary Grant. And I'm like... Guilty. Guilty as charged. <laughs> yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> now, she was nominated for an Academy Award for uh, the movie titled Come to the Stable, which was in 1949. And um, she had a part as a painter specializing in nativity scenes. I don't remember if her husband was in that one. Um, now, she, in the 40s and 50s, she continued to uh, appear in film as well as on stage. She uh, picked up her cabaret and vaudeville routines and... Um, As a matter of fact, 
um, because in the fifties, especially like in the late forties and, and in the fifties, uh, there was like a, a spurt of movies that showed and of course, you also consider that in the fifties there there was the musical craze. Uh, uh, Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire were releasing a lot of musicals, and so the idea of stage on screen was big. Well, here's the other thing: is that You had movies like uh, the movie about Houdini that had Tony Curtis, and which is it's a good movie. I, <laughs> uh, in fact, his 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 wife is in it too, and I can't think of she's the one that's in um, Psycho. I can't think of her name right now, but they're in that movie together, and they play husband and wife. You know the. Uh, Houdini and Houdini's wife in that movie. And it's it's a good <laughs> which it cracks me up that people are like, oh yeah, they need to make a movie about Houdini. They have. <laughs> so uh but she would appear every once in a while on stage at this theater called the Turnabout Theater in Hollywood. Um, it's still there, I think. No, it's not. <laughs> um, I guess it was torn down in 1956. Never mind. Um, she would perform vaudeville acts um, with, as well as uh, alongside a marionette show as well as singing songs she later recorded um, on LPs. Now, uh, as for film, she appeared in Inspector General with Danny Kaye. And, and, and this is where um, I was talking about like the musicals and, and vaudeville and everything. She, shows up in the uh, movie Three Ring Circus, which was in 1954, as a bearded lady alongside Jerry Lewis. And, um, and then a screen version of Agatha Christie's 1953 play, in 1957 called Witness for the Prosecution alongside Charles Layton. They both received Academy Award nominations. This was uh, her second time as Best Supporting Actress and it was his third for Best Actor. Neither one of them won. Um, she did win a Golden Globe, however, for Best Supporting Actress for that film. Um, now, I I had forgotten that she was in Bell Book and Candle. You know, a lot of people talk about how great that movie is. I remember watching it. I actually went back and I watched it because my parents have it. I watched it again. I still don't like it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure a lot of people are going to hurt me, but <laughs> I just... I watched it in middle school and because my parents were uh, renting a lot of the old movies and, and, I, and of course, middle schooler might like it, might not. And I just remember I was so bored. <laughs> well, then I, like I said, I sat and I watched it cause I, I didn't remember Elsa Lanchester being in the movie so I sat and I, I watched it and I I still don't like it. <laughs> Sorry guys. But it was and I just, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> 
Now we're rolling into the 60s. And of course, this is when she appears in Mary Poppins. And <laughs> it's funny to me that she has such a short appearance in this movie. But so many people remember her as being in this movie. But here's here's the other thing. Okay. Because as I was trying to find a picture to use for this video, I kept getting uh Poppins Returns or whatever it's called, the the uh the newer movie. Um why do they have the gal that plays uh i guess they call her mary poppins she's dressed a lot like i mean her hat is like katie nana she's not dressed anything like mary poppins i mean like i didn't see the movie so i don't i i'm in the dark but her hat that was the thing that was so glaring to me was that her hat is like katie nana's why didn't they make the hat the 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 big thing about mary poppins is that she has that hat with the berries and the the, the like the little bird on it or whatever and that's not what they did <laughs> i i was surprised <laughs> Yeah, that 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 was surprising to me. But she appeared in other Disney movies as well. As I said, in That Darn Cat, she plays the nosy neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Seriously, if you've never seen the original That Darn Cat, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> She also appears in Blackbeard's Ghost, um, 1968, the one with Peter Ustinov and uh, Suzanne Plachette, Dean Jones, and uh, <laughs> and of course, Elsa Lanchester. And the funny thing about that is when you look, when you watch that movie, because of course I, I watched it before doing this, and I'm like, there's a lot that they took from the seriously they the, the people who did pirates of the caribbean must have sat down and actually took especially like the the warming the bed warming thing as <laughs> oh man and there was another movie that she did uh another uh disney movie that she did later in the i think it's in the 70s called rascal wasn't very good i mean like she's the only one worth watching <laughs> if you like it that's fine but the book was better <laughs> that's one of those you're not gonna win them all you know that that's just the bottom line is that rascal was just it's so forgettable the movie is i mean again it's based off of a book and and i went through a phase of reading the books that disney movies were based off of and i read the book and i'm like this is so much better than the <laughs> but again it was almost like she was the only thing worth she was the only one worth watching <laughs> and she appeared <laughs> You know, one one of my favorite uh, movies is uh, Pajama Party. And uh, it, it has Annette Funicello, Tommy Kirk, and it has all these, well, Elsa Lanchester is in it. And, and it has Buster Keaton in it. Buster Keaton appears in it. And, I mean, he's just wandering around all over the place. This It's such a mess of silliness that I love it. And uh, 
it's just so funny. And so, and, and it's always put in with the, uh, with the, with the beach parties, uh, with the, with the beach movies that, that Annette did. And I guess I have to watch it again because I don't remember it taking place so much at the beach. So, but when I was looking for, like I said, when I was looking for pictures and everything, there are publicity stills with Elsa and Buster Keaton. The problem is, is that there was so much of the uh, tagging on it that I wasn't going to use it for this. And uh, really, <laughs> you found it on the internet and you're going to, okay, that makes so much sense. But um, now she appeared in uh, quite a few TV shows, just like uh, um, I Love Lucy uh, and Man from Uncle. There was also the, I mean, like everybody had a TV show at one time. There's uh, the Tennessee Ernie Ford show. Um, she appeared in that. Wonderful World of Disney she appeared in, and um, which makes sense because she had already appeared in several of the. <laughs> And, and so, and again, she was still, uh, uh, appearing on stage and in movies such as an Elvis Presley movie. She sang with Elvis Presley. <laughs> the movie is titled Easy Come, Easy Go, uh, in 1967. That one surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I knew about Angela Lansbury uh, playing, may she rest in peace, playing uh, his mom in one of the movies. But I had no idea that um, Elsa Lanchester was in one of his movies. <laughs> oh, good heavens. And then, of course, we get to now we're coming close to the 70s and we're getting close to one of my. <laughs> OK, now I love the movie Clue. All right. I absolutely I actually have it up here. It's right here next to my box set of the mummy movies. And she was in. Uh, a 1976 movie that is a spoof on a, a lot of different things it was spoofing agatha christie it was spoofing like the detective uh a lot of the different detective i think it was spoofing columbo which is funny because peter folk was in it <laughs> the movie is titled murder by death and this, oh my gosh, this has such a big cast in it. I mean, it is, and it's one of those that have, okay, so now there's the movies like Knives Out and, and those types of movies. You have to understand. <laughs> Movies like that are inspired by movies like Clue and Murder by Death. Okay. Because I can't tell you how many times I'll be watching clips of uh, Murder by Death or Clue and people are like, they're, they're like, well, this just took from it. And it's like, okay. <laughs> 1976 came first. <laughs> I don't remember. The 80s came first. <laughs> Plus, Clue is based off of a game that came in, like, the 40s. What the hell? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> I mean, like, Alec Guinness is in, Sir Alec Guinness is in this movie. All right. And he plays a blind 
butler. <laughs> um, they they spoof like Hercule Poirot, Miss Marple, and just uh, Maggie Smith is in it. So those of you that are Harry Potter fans, her. <laughs> And uh, Elsa Lanchester, Truman Capote is in it, Peter Falk is in it, and yeah, David Niven is, oh yeah, David Niven, Peter Sellers is in it. It's just a riot, an absolute riot. <laughs> and the puns and the innuendo and... <laughs> It's it's one of my favorite movies, and they finally put it on Blu-ray, and I need to get it. It's just... <laughs> ever since my, like I said, my parents were renting a lot of these movies, and ever since my mom rented it, it's <laughs> I've loved it ever since. It is so hilarious. So Elsa Lanchester is in it, and. And yeah, when you see all the stuff that they are spoofing, it's just, it's everything and in the kitchen sink and it just doesn't stop. <laughs> and it makes you wonder how they were able to keep a straight face, especially when you have Peter Sellers on set. <laughs> oh, good heavens. And, um... And then she had a an LP that was entitled Cockney London, which is a selection of old London songs for which uh, her husband wrote the sleeve notes. And um, so, yeah, when it comes to her and Charles. So with all of this, you know, with this successful life and everything. Now, uh, Charles passed away in uh, 1962. Uh, I forgot to mention that. So in 1962 is when he passed away. Now, for some reason, as much as I don't want to talk about this, I feel I need to because every everywhere it was mentioned um and and even it's it, she talked about it in her book um she because she, she published a book in 1938 about her relationship with charles called charles layton and i and then in 1983 she released an autobiography titled elsa lanchester herself and she talks about why she and charles never had children and it was because of his sexuality. Okay, well, that was immediately brought into question <laughs> because Maureen O'Hara immediately came to the defense of Charles. Now, Charles has been dead for 20 years at this point. Okay. I, you know... My mother has talked about this for quite some time. You know, it, she would constantly bring up that Elsa Lanchester would say that her husband was homosexual and that's why they couldn't have kids and everything. And okay, so just just keep with me on this. So Maureen O'Hara denied that this happened. You know, th that it was, that he was homosexual and everything. And Charles had told Maureen O'Hara that Elsa had a botched abortion. And when she was performing as a burlesque dancer, now, 
she admitted in the book that she had two abortions in her youth. But didn't say if it was because, but wouldn't say that it was, that it made it so she was incapable of having kids. Um, basically, she was telling people that she didn't have kids because she didn't want any. And uh, that's what she told her biographer. And it's like, well, if you told your biographer that you didn't want kids, why did you say that to your, say that about your husband, your dead husband? <laughs> so here's, here's my theory. Okay. All right. I think it's a massive insecurity on her part. Okay, she had the abortion, and she was embarrassed by it. And when she revealed that in her book, her defense was to blame her husband. Not a good defense not a good one at all because let me tell you something let me tell you something right now every picture that i ever saw of these two it was like they were absolutely in love i mean they were always holding hands they were hugging each other they were it was i'm sorry i don't Yeah, I don't, I'm not going to, no. <laughs> Is it okay? No. Okay. She should not have said that about Charles at all, insecure or not. Okay, because at this point in 83... <laughs> She's, she's 80. She should not have said that. I mean, I, I give credit to Maureen O'Hara for standing up for Charles and saying, hang on, no. <laughs> Charles, so she obviously told Charles about the botched abortion. Uh, Elsa did. And, and she told her biographer she didn't yeah it i mean you can take it as you will am i <laughs> a lot of places have talked about this you know when they're talking about her because she did write it so she admitted about this and i know that it is very controversial okay i understand that I'm going to tell you right now, I really do think that she was very insecure. It was very hard for her to explain it. I don't agree with her saying that about her dead husband. Okay. Am I saying that you need to dislike Elsa? Absolutely not. If you have always been a fan of Elsa Lanchester, still be a fan. Okay. <laughs> This is just one of those things that she did. She's human. Okay. We are all human. We we do things like this. We all have skeletons. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to tell you something right now. When you read up on Elsa Lanchester, everybody's going to be talking about that. Every site is going to mention this because she said it in her book. So I felt I needed to talk about it too. So moving on from that, <laughs> I really didn't want to talk about it, but I knew I had to. <laughs> so on December 26th, 1986, Elsa Lanchester passed away at the age of 84. 
And uh, now before that, um, she, her health had been deteriorating and um, she had suffered two strokes and had become completely incapacitated. She needed constant care and was confined to bed rest. Can you imagine? Oh, gosh. <laughs> this woman who was a dancer and a singer had been on stage and was a an actress and everything, just confined to a bed. It had to be devastating. You know, I remember my grandpa when he had his stroke and he he laid there and now this is somebody who loved working with his hands he was a carpenter he he was a mechanic he loved to drive everywhere and just he loved cars i mean <laughs> and when they told him that he probably would never be able to do any of those things again it broke his heart he he laid there and he just started crying <laughs> Can you imagine what it was like for her just not being able? Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, so, yeah, on December 26, 1986, she passed away at the age of 84. So, this is Elsa Lanchester. This is the woman who gave us the iconic character, Bride of Frankenstein. She is so much more than that. <laughs> and yes, she does have a few skeletons in her closet, but just remember that she is human. I mean, all of us have skeletons, things that we are hiding and things that we don't want to talk about with other people. And um, so I just want you to realize that and um, don't turn away from her just because of that. I want you to continue to be a fan of her. And um, and I will have um, all those links in the description box, links of her music and everything else, um, her family and and all of it. So anyway, that is Elsa Lanchester.